let's get and happy Monday, everyone. On Myanmar, we've been asked by many of you about the travels of the Secretary General's Special Envoy, Christine schreiner bergener What I can tell you is that we will continue to support ASEAN's important role as reflected in the Special Envoy's visit to Jakarta, Indonesia, where she held ministerial and other meetings on the sidelines of the ASEAN Leaders' Meeting on the 24th of April. Timely and comprehensive implementation of ASEAN's five points of consensus from that meeting will be important. They include a call for immediate cessation of violence and for all parties to exercise utmost restraint, ASEAN humanitarian assistance, and, and constructive dialogue among all to seek peaceful solution. We continue to urge the release of all detainees and for the full respect of human rights and fundamental freedoms. The Secretary General and his Special Envoy continue to urge for a unified response by member states and appeal for support to the UN system, regional efforts that can help deter further escalation of the crisis. The Secretary General is, is in Geneva, where tomorrow he will convene the informal 5 plus 1 meeting on the Cyprus issue. Stefan will brief the press in Geneva tomorrow morning to share more details on the meeting, including the heads of delegations. Over the weekend, Tor Wenesland, the UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, voiced his alarm at the recent escalations in Jerusalem and around Gaza. He condemned all such acts of violence and reiterated his call upon all sides to exercise maximum restraint and avoid further escalation, particularly during the holy month of Ramadan and this politically charged time for all. He said that the provocative acts around Jerusalem must cease. The indiscriminate launching of rockets towards Israeli population centers violates international law and must stop immediately had it. The UN is still actively working to de-escalate the situation. Janine hennis blishert the Secretary General's Special Representative for Iraq, expressed shock and pain yesterday at the normality of the tragic incident that befell COVID-19 patients at the Ibn Khatib Hospital in Baghdad on Saturday night. She offered her deepest condolences to the families of those who lost their lives and wishes the injured a full and speedy recovery. The special representative called for stronger protection measures to ensure that such a disaster cannot reoccur. And I'd like to add that the Secretary General shares those sentiments. The Security Council met this morning on Sudan and South Sudan. Briefing Council members, the UN Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa, Fafe Onanga Nyanga, expressed hope that Sudan and South Sudan will continue to build on their improved relations. So far, he said that Sudan and South Sudan have been focusing on the respective political transitions and the fast-moving border, broader regional dynamics. Mr. Nanga Nyanga said he was pleased to report that significant progress has been achieved on resolving the conflict in South Kordofan and Blue Nile states with last month's signing of a Declaration of Principles. This provides for the establishment of a civic, democratic, and federal state where freedom of religion, belief, practices, and worship shall be guaranteed. Also speaking to the Council was Undersecretary General for Peace Operations Jean-Pierre Lacroix, who noted that the general security situation in the Abe area has been relatively calm, but is, is volatile and unpredictable. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic, Mr. Lacroix said the UN and its partners have continued to provide vital humanitarian and other assistance in Abye. Meanwhile, the Secretary General's new special representative at the head of the UN mission in South Sudan, Nicholas Haysom, has arrived in the country. He said that the United Nations is strongly committed to working with the people and leaders of South Sudan to secure stability and eventual prosperity for the world's newest nation. Mr. Haysom said that South Sudan is entering a new phase and people's expectations are high, adding there's real hope for progress in the implementation of the peace agreement and ultimately achieving a more durable peace. Now turning to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Today, UNICEF is warning the surge in violence in the province of Ituri Listening the plight of children. Since January, nearly 175 grave violations against boys and girls have been reported. These include cases of rec recruitment of children into armed groups, the killing and maiming of children, sexual violence, and attacks against schools and hospitals. More than 1.6 million people are estimated to be displaced in Ituri, out of a total population of 5.7 million. Over 100,000 children under five are suffering from severe acute malnutrition. Through its rapid response mechanism, UNICEF has provided non-food and hygiene items to more than 8,000 people fleeing recent attacks. UNICEF is appealing for additional support as its 2021 humanitarian appeal is currently only 18% funded. Turning to Ethiopia, our humanitarian colleagues tell us that the security situation in the Amhara region remains tense and volatile due to intercommunal clashes 
that resulted in massive population displacement and the looting and destruction of property infrastructure. The number of casualties is undetermined. Fighting erupted in Amhara's North Shawa zone on the 18th of March after a person was killed. Attacks two days later displaced at least 60,000 people across North Shawa and Oromia special zones. A second wave of attacks on the 17th of April in urban centers and along major roads caused much larger displacement and devastation. Humanitarian partners haven't verified displacement figures because of insecurity. However, regional authorities estimate that at least 330,000 people are displaced in both North Shewa and Oromia special zones. Needs and risk assessments will be conducted once the security situation permits. In neighboring Somalia, the federal government, in consultation with the UN, yesterday declared drought conditions in the country following delayed and poor successive rain seasons and harsh, warmer weather. More than 80% of Somalia is experiencing moderate to severe drought conditions, with the worst affected areas including parts of Somaliland and Puntland and the central and ghetto regions. At least 3.4 million people are projected to be affected by drought by the end of 2021, of whom around 380,000 are expected to be displaced. So far, more than 116,000 people have been displaced by severe water shortages and drought conditions between October 2020 and April 2021. The UN and its partners have received 353,000 people with temporary safe water services, 40,000 with improved sanitation, and 25,000 with health services. But funding shortfalls are a major challenge in scaling up the response. So far, only 15.5% of the $1.09 billion required to help 4 million of the most vulnerable Somalis in 2021 has been received. The UN Refugee Agency and the UN Migration Agency today said they're deeply saddened by the loss of at least two lives after a boat capsized off Venezuela's shores on Thursday. According to local authorities, at least 24 people, including several children, are believed to have been on board the boat heading towards Trinidad and Tobago. Eduardo Stein, the Joint Special Representative of UNHCR and IOM for Venezuelan Refugees and Migrants, called for the establishment of regular and safe pathways, including through humanitarian visas and family reunification as well as the implementation of adequate reception mechanisms to prevent the use of irregular routes, smuggling, and trafficking. On Colombia, the country has received a second shipment of 912,000 doses of COVID-19 vaccines. Acting Resident Coordinator Jessica Fayeta commended Com Colombia's efforts to speed up vaccinations and to contribute financially to the COVAX facility. Also in Colombia, the UN team today rejected and condemned violence against human rights defenders social and community leaders, communities, and former combatants of the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, People's Army. The UN team reiterated the Secretary General's call for the immediate cessation of hostilities to enable a proper response to and recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. The UN team also calls for strengthening measures to effectively safeguard the life and rights of all people in territories affected by conflict and violence. A new report released today by the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs says that progress in protecting the world's forests and the people who rely on them is at risk due to the devastating impacts of the pandemic and the escalating climate and biodiversity crises. According to the report, the world has been making progress in key areas, such as advancing the global forest area through afforestation and, re and restoration. However, these advances are being threatened by the overall worsening state of our natural environment, including land degradation, pests and invasive species, fires, storms, and droughts. The, forest, the report is being launched as countries begin meetings of the UN Forum on Forests today, which will review progress of the UN's strategic plan for forests 2030 and its six global forest goals. More information is available online. The World Health Organization, the UN Children's Fund, and Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, today warned that while immunization services have started to recover from disruptions caused by COVID-19, Millions of children remain vulnerable to deadly diseases. Campaigns to immunize against measles are the most impacted. To help tackle these challenges and support the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, WHO, UNICEF, Gavi, and other partners today launched the Immunization Agenda 2030, an ambitious new global strategy to maximize the life-saving impact of vaccines through stronger immunization systems. If fully implemented, the agenda will avert an estimated 30, uh, an estimated 50 million deaths. More information online. The UN Refugee Agency today announced the appointment of popular TV personality Raya Abir Rashid as a regional goodwill ambassador for the Middle East and North Africa. 
Ms. Abby Rochelle has been working as a high profile supporter with UNHCR since 2017 and a powerful voice and advocate for the forcibly displaced around the world. She's the first male Arab to be appointed as UNH UNHCR Goodwill Ambassador. Today is International Chernobyl Disaster Remembrance Day. In his message for the day, the Secretary General noted that today we mark the 35th anniversary of the accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant on the 26th of April, 1986. He said that hundreds of thousands of people were affected by radiation and their suffering must not be forgotten. The Secretary General highlighted that the Chernobyl disaster was contained by governments working with academics, civil society, and others for the common good. He added that it holds important lessons for today's efforts to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Secretary General stressed the disaster knows no borders, but together he said, we can work to prevent and contain them, support all those in need, and build a stronger recovery. Today is also World Intellectual Property Day. This year, the day focused on the critical role of small and medium-sized enterprises in the economy and how they can use intellectual property rights to build stronger, more competitive, and resilient businesses. And I have a senior personnel appointment to tell you about. Today, the Secretary General is appointing Courtney Rattray of Jamaica as High Representative for the Least Developed Countries, Landlocked Developing Countries, and Small Island Developing States. He will succeed Fekita Moila Katoa Uta Kamano of Tonga, to whom the Secretary General is grateful for her dedication and commitment to the United Nations. Currently the permanent representative of Jamaica to the UN in New York, Ms. Ra Mr. Rattray brings to the position broad-based managerial and leadership experience with a focus on addressing the development challenges faced by countries in special situations, particularly in the area of development finance. Much more in an announcement being sent out now. And last, but by no means least, we say thank you to our friends in Tokyo. Japan has paid its full payment to the regular budget. We're now at 93 fully paid up member states, and we have just 100 more to go. And uh, once you're done with me, uh, I'll turn the floor over to Brendan Varma, the uh, spokesperson for the, um, for the uh, president of the General Assembly. Uh, and uh, before we uh, go to him, uh, uh, we'll uh, take some questions. I see there are a couple of hands raised in the room. Um, I think in the front, uh, if I can see more clearly, I can't quite see who it is, but uh, uh, is it Edie? Please, uh, please, uh, you have the floor, Edie. First, um, a follow-up on uh, Myanmar and Christine Schranabergner. Can you give us some details of who she met with in Jakarta? Did she try and see anybody from the Myanmar delegation that was there? And what specifically is she going to be doing to follow up on the five points in the ASEAN Declaration? And then I have another question. Uh, uh, well, regarding that, yes, um, uh, she had a number of engagements in Jakarta, including with a number of the foreign ministers who were present from the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And, uh, and she also had a meeting with Myanmar's Commander-in-Chief, Min Aung Lang, and she does aim uh, to maintain her dialogue with all stakeholders in Myanmar, including the uh, Your next question? Um, no, a follow-up on that. In her meeting with uh, the military commander, um, did she make an appeal to... Uh, visit Myanmar without preconditions? What was his response and what else did they discuss? I don't think uh, it would uh, be particularly helpful to share uh, the precise details of the meeting uh, at, this, at this stage. Uh, the big point is that she does intend to continue her dialogue uh, with a number of Myanmar stakeholders, and, and that includes her intention to, uh, to maintain her dialogue with the military. And so that will go ahead. My question uh, was about uh, Alexei Navalny and the suspension of uh, all of his offices across the country 
while a court considers uh, whether um, they are extremist operations, does the Secretary General have uh, any comment on um, this apparent effort uh, to um, close down the offices of Russia's leading opposition leader? Uh, we are looking into these reports. Of course, uh, we've made our, clear our, our concerns about Mr. Navalny's case, uh, including, of course, our concerns about uh, uh, his reported health conditions and his need uh, 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 for, uh, for medical treatment. Uh, but uh, but uh, certainly, uh, we expect that Mr. Navalny and all of uh, his supporters are are to be treated uh, fairly, and uh, and uh, we will continue to monitor to make sure uh, that uh, that uh, that their treatment is uh, is uh, indeed uh, fair and uh, and uh, is proceeding uh, in accordance uh, with respect, uh, among other things, for for uh, for human rights defenders. Uh, yes, um, Celia. Uh, Fan. It's about Chad. Did the Secretary General talk with the new president of Chad, uh, Muhammad Idris Deby? And following uh, Edith's question, did the Secretary General had a talk about Navalny with the President Putin? Uh, on, on the question of Mr. Navalny, I, can't, uh, I don't have any details of any contacts with President Putin to share. Um, but uh, regarding uh, your question, uh, your other question, a question on Chad, uh, what I can say is that uh, Special Representative Fall, uh, the head of the UN office in Central Africa, uh, uh, continued his own consultations in Chad over the weekend, and he's been there since last Friday. He represented the Secretary General at the state funeral for President Idris Debi Itno, and has since been meeting with key national stakeholders in the context of his mandate for good offices and uh, conflict prevention in the region. The UN stands ready to support the efforts of the African Union and the Chadian stakeholders in this process. A consensual and inclusive return to civilian rule and constitutional order is essential to sustaining peace. And we welcome in this respect the appointment today of a civilian prime minister, Albert Bahimi Badake. Uh, so uh, that is what I have to say on that. Uh, I believe uh, Majid Gili has a question. Uh, so, uh, Majid, over to you. Thank you, Farhan. I have two questions. The first is about uh, uh, Iraq. Uh, Turkey started a military operation, uh, another cross-border military operation against PKK fighters, and this resulted in the thousands or hundreds of villagers leaving their villages on the border. More than 500 villages uh, due to this continued operation has been emptied due to this operation. Uh, what is the United Nations reaction for this? And after that, I have another question. Thank you. Uh, well, we've, uh, we've uh, made clear our concerns about the various uh, uh, armed uh, actions throughout Iraq. And uh, as you know, UNAMI has been working with the various parties to, uh, to make sure that uh, the situation is de-escalated. But I'll see in regard to this latest incident whether we have anything uh, specific to say. Uh, yeah, it's what, what's your other? Yeah, it's on Turkish military operation. So the second one is on, on what's happening in Eastern Europe. I mean, uh, um, just today there was, in the last couple of days, there was more, most of the, uh, I would say most of the Eastern European countries expelled Russian diplomats and returned Russia also expelled diplomats uh, from, uh, from Moscow. This tension seems to be rising in Eastern Europe. Has the Secretary General uh, uh, had any discussion with with uh, the president of Russia or any high level uh, Russian leadership and also the Ukrainians with that regard? Recently, I'm talking about. Well, regarding the the situation between Russia and the Ukraine, that's that's a separate topic on which um, on which uh, we've uh, expressed our previous concerns, and I have nothing new to add on that. Uh, regarding um, the recent uh, issues involving uh, different. Uh, bilateral relations between uh, some of the Eastern European states. Uh, those are, of course, uh, bilateral issues, and we trust and expect uh, that uh, the 
countries involved uh, will resolve uh, these issues uh, diplomatically, and uh, and we express our confidence in them in that effort. Um, Thank you for our thanks, uh, Toby. Over to you. Thanks, Farhan. Nice to see you. Uh, back to Myanmar for a second. I know that these are sensitive discussions right now, and we can't go into too many details about the conversation between uh, uh, Special Envoy Schroeder Bergner and um, the, the military commander. But can you tell us the conditions of their meeting? Like, how long did it last? Did they sit down together? Was this a formal a chat? Uh, can you, like, you know, give us the a, a description of of the conditions of their meeting. Thank you. Hi everyone, so Farhan's WebEx just quit. He's just restarting it now. Please bear with us, thank you. Uh, hi. Um, can, can you turn on my um, Can you turn on my camera? Uh, I know you can't see me, but I'm I'm back. I'm just waiting for my camera to be restarted. Um, okay, uh, while I wait for, for any video, I, 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 uh, I can take, uh, Toby's question. Toby, you'll have to restart it. I, uh, how my, uh, my, uh, computer suddenly quit. So it's, it's back. So can you please, uh, ask me a question one more time? Sure. Can, can you hear me, Farhan? Yeah, okay? I can hear you. Oh. I can hear you. Okay. My question was, I, I know that it's a sensitive discussion, uh, that, uh, was had between the special envoy and the head of the military uh, in Jakarta, so you don't want to go into details on that. But can you tell us the conditions of the meeting? Like, how long did it last? Did they sit down in a formal way? Uh, what you know? What did this meeting look like procedurally? Thank you. Uh, I I don't have any further uh, details to share. I, this is part of her. Um, this was part of her engagement. Uh, uh, base, you know, basically uh, part of her engagement with people on the margins of the meeting of ASEAN in Jakarta. Uh, and uh, and so it, one of those meetings was with uh, the commander in chief and uh, and she does aim to maintain her dialogue uh, with all the various stakeholders in Myanmar. That That's as much as I can say on this for now. Uh, okay, uh, James Rhinel, I believe had a question. Hi, Farhan, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Thanks so much. Um, so yeah, earlier today, there was a meeting on the COVID pandemic, or rather on pandemic preparedness and getting us ready for the next one. Um, uh, Linda Thomas-Greenfield spoke at it, and it was jointly hosted with Argentina, Japan, Norway, and South Africa. A um, uh, couple of questions. Um, one of them is that there, there was a suggestion that Kamala Harris, the U.S. Vice President, was going to be taking part. Do you happen to know if that did happen? And also, was there anybody from the Secretariat there? And if they were, what was the position from the U.N. about whether or not we're ready for the next time a pandemic strikes? Uh, yeah, uh, on that, uh, yes, um, this, uh, this, is, uh, this is not uh, an open meeting. Uh, but 
I do believe that uh, the vice president uh, of the U.S., uh, Kamala Harris, was there. Uh, the secretary general also had a, a video message to today's event, which concerned pandemic preparedness and response financing architecture. Uh, he said that to respond and recover better from the COVID-19 pandemic, we need more investment in the sustainable development goals. He said if we had advanced further on the SDGs, we would have been better prepared to weather the COVID-19 crisis. He said that as well as urgently tackling the pandemic at hand, we need to build a global system that deals with problems before they turn into catastrophes. And to end the COVID-19 crisis and prevent new emergencies, he pointed to five areas of focus. First, to work together in solidarity. Second, to make peace with nature. Third, to increase, uh, to invest in risk surveillance and social safety nets. Fourth, to act on pandemic preparedness. And finally, uh, to anticipate crises and act early. Okay, um, wait one second. I think uh, I can start you. my video Sorry, now. Thank you, oh, thank you for him. Just a teeny weeny quick follow up. You said that was a video message. Is that one of those video messages that is uh, um, that we can access, or do you have a complete transcript of what he said? Uh, it's a it's a video message. So we have the transcript as he delivered it to video. I I, I will try to share it with you. Uh, we're checking that, and we'll try to share that around as soon as we can. Thank you, Dave. Okay. Um, and uh, I believe Edie's hand is up. Uh, uh, Edie, you have another question? And, and then Abdul Hamid after you. A follow up on Myanmar and then a question on something else. Follow up on Myanmar. Um, what is the aim of Christine Schranner-Bergner in all these meetings? What is she hoping to achieve? The basic thing is she wants, uh, uh, in this case, to support ASEAN's important role uh, in, in, and, uh, and take forward the five point consensus. And that in particular includes the call for an immediate cessation of violence and for res utmost restraint, uh, the idea of humanitarian assistance from, uh, from ASEAN, and the idea of dialogue among all of, of, for a peaceful solution. And uh, along with that, uh, Ms. Rana Bergner uh, continues to push for the release of all detainees and for the full respect of human rights and fundamental freedoms. Um, thank you. On a su totally different subject, um, a leading Syrian human rights group uh, today urged the entire international community to reject the uh, Syrian election next month, um, among other things, because it does not follow what is required in the 2015 uh, Security Council re resolution, which calls for UN supervised elections. Does the Secretary General have any comment? Well, First of all, about the elections, it's clear that the election was called uh, under the auspices of the current constitution, and it's not part of the political process established by Security Council Resolu Resolution 2254. We're not involved in, in the election, and we don't have a mandate to be involved in the election. And I think Stefan made that uh, clear last week. At the same time, we continue to stress the importance of a negotiated political solution to the conflict in, in Syria. In this regard, Resolution 2254 mandates the UN to facilitate a political process that culminates in the holding of free and fair elections in accordance with the new constitution administered under UN supervision to the highest international standards and that are inclusive of all Syrians, including members of the diaspora. Okay, um, Abdelhamid and then Mr. Sato and then, and then Evelyn. Thank you, Farhan. <clears throat> Today, Israel decided to shut off the uh, beaches of Gaza to prevent fishermen to go on their daily life and trying to find some uh, fishing. Uh, the number of people injured in Jerusalem over 135, 
And the whole world has been commenting on what's going on in Jerusalem, except the United Nations. And when I asked Mr. Uh, Stefan Dujaric last Friday, he took me back to the statement of Mr. Wins, uh, uh, to Mr. Thor Winsland, which was three days or two days before. We had nothing to do with what's happening in Jerusalem. So why there is no specific statement from the uh, special coordinator about what's going on now in Jerusalem? Well, regarding what's happening, we, that is to say, uh, 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 the Secretary General and, and we in the Secretariat, reiterate Special Coordinator Venislan's statement of Saturday, in which he expressed alarm at the recent escalations in Jerusalem and around Gaza, and called on all sides to exercise maximum restraint and avoid uh, further escalations, particularly during the holy month of uh, Ramadan. And we continue uh, uh, to make that call. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, Mr. Venislan will continue with his work to de-escalate tensions. Uh, he met with Israeli officials today, and he's going to travel tomorrow to Jordan and Egypt for further discussions. So he, he's continuing with his work, and we are continuing to scout in support uh, of him. Uh, that he received a letter from the Israeli officials threatening Gaza of major escalation if they don't stop these rockets fired at the Israeli uh, uh, towns and settlements. Uh, no, I don't have any confirmation of that. Uh, like I said, he did meet with the Israeli officials this morning, so he is in discussions with them, and uh, he will be in discussions with Jordanian and, and Egyptian officials as well. Uh, Mr. Sato, and then Evelyn. Hi, uh, how are you? So, uh, for, uh, uh, following up on the Myanmar, please. So, uh, after ASEAN summit meeting, uh, the member states of ASEAN, including Myanmar, uh, seem to have accepted the uh, special envoy of ASEAN, not of the UN. So how is a uh, uh, special representative, the Bergner, uh, is going to collaborate with and coordinate with the uh, uh, envoy of ASEAN to meet the UN goal? She, she'll be in, in, uh, in coordination with a number of officials. She did meet, uh, besides the, the officials uh, in Myanmar, she did meet with a number of different uh, of, of foreign ministers of ASEAN member states as well. And so she will continue her work with them and with the envoys uh, of ASEAN. She believes it's important uh, that ASEAN play a key role in resolving this crisis, and she's working uh, with them in that. Uh, and um, uh, Evelyn, and then Iftikhar. Uh, thank you, Farhan. Do you read the chat? Because I've been trying to put a question in there anyway. Um, good to see you. Uh, I have a couple questions. The first one is on the um, on Myanmar, Burma, uh, ASEAN. ASEAN did not, in fact, deliberately uh, omitted suggestions that a call for the release of detainees, which the special envoy, as well as the secretary general, has called for. Has there was there any follow up after the meeting? in this particular very important omission? Well, regarding that, uh, as, as I said earlier, uh, uh, the Secretary General and uh, Christine Shana Bergener continue to push for the release of all detainees, and that is part of her discussions with her interlocutors, and she is moving forward with that issue. Secondly, Venezuela, uh, the United Nations seems to be playing a bigger role than before. And I wonder if you can elaborate on it. Will any of it be political or strictly humanitarian or what? Uh, at, at this stage, uh, there's, there's nothing uh, particular uh, that is new to say. You, you know uh, of the work that uh, Eduardo Stein is doing, and that is uh, of a humanitarian nature. Uh, uh, there's, there's nothing uh, to say about any other profile at this, at this point. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, and Iftikhar. Uh, thank you, Farhan. Uh, uh, you know, over the weekend, the uh, violence, violence in Afghanistan has escalated. Uh, what is being done in this connection to stop it? And 
uh, any update on the uh, Istanbul meeting which, uh, for which efforts are being made to uh, fix a date? Uh, yes, uh, we continue to be in discussions, including through our special representative on the ground, Deborah Lyons, about a possible new date. There's nothing uh, to say about this right now. As you know, we will wait uh, until the end of the holy month of Ramzan, and uh, we'll see what date we can get after that. Uh, and of course, we deplore all uh, the violence that has been happening. Uh, you'll have seen what uh, our mission in Afghanistan, UNAMA, has been saying, and, and we continue to work uh, with uh, the government of Afghanistan in, in dealing with these issues. And with that, I, I don't see any further questions. Uh, so 